Hi, Columbus. Hold on a second. Yeah, here we go. All right. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So here it is, July 9th, 2022. We're at the July Free Press Salon in uh, Columbus, Ohio. And I uh, want to welcome everybody to come and, and, and are uh, joining this conversation. Um, this, uh, this picture I'm starting with uh, is from a movie I saw yesterday, but it is sort of, it's sort of poignant to what we're talking about. It's the Supreme Court is collapsing around um, uh, politics and, and actually extreme politics. And so the, 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 the rule of law and all that other things that are, are being challenged. I mean, uh, the Janus decision a few years ago that uh, impacted uh, union workers to the whole gamut of decisions that happened in this session, which we're going to try to capture a little bit um, what that is. Uh, it's showing that uh, the facade of the... Okay, yeah, yeah, Bill, you will a little bit later. Yep, thank you. Um, the facade that the, the Supreme Court has for us as rule of law and everything, it's collapsing. And so I just wanted to show this real quick just <laughs> to give us a little feeling of what's going on. Uh, so um, we're going to have Ted Glick coming in. He, he's, uh, I believe, still living in New Jersey, and he'll update himself where he's at and everything. But he's with the uh, Beyond Extreme Climate uh, uh, Coalition, has done work over the years, independent political action, um, uh, stuff during the Vietnam War. And I don't know how deep he wants to get into all his pol uh, politics, but I'm going to let him sort of start out because he, he's needing to get in and out. He's going to give a little focus on what the Supreme Court's decision uh, has impacted uh, what, would be, what we could call administrative authority. And where, where is that type of uh, these decisions, especially about the EPA uh, and Clean, A uh, Clean Air Act and the enforcement of such uh, not just statutory but also administrative decisions, what, what does this current court uh, court's decisions, where does that leave people that basically relied on the courts and, and legislations and all the other um, potentials for us to, to, to um, have rights, um, so-called rights? Um, we're finding that <laughs> rights can be taken away, evidently. So, Ted, why don't you um, do, do a quick... A presentation of your your where you're at and maybe we can go go into some conversation about that and then Felicia and Mary Jane will we'll talk how, how we want to go but uh, uh, again thank you for the speakers and everybody else that's joined uh, Bill we'll, we'll get you in on the charter review as well um, because we do have a local uh, uh, problem going on uh, reality going on our every few years our city council does a charter review and right now they're being pretty undemocratic about it and a lot of changes are happening we're moving from a seven to a nine person council and and, and it's supposed to be a district but it's being voted all all uh city uh four districts so it's a very hybrid and it's very strange so ted uh go ahead with your uh, presentation please thank you and welcome and it's great seeing you yeah, no, you too, Mark. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, just a couple things about me. The the group is Beyond Extreme Energy. That's the name of the primary group that I'm working with these days uh, on the climate crisis. Um, and the other thing I want to mention is uh, there's two books uh, that I've had that I've written that were published, one in 2020, one in 2021. The first one, uh, 2020, is Burglar for Peace, and that's about my activism during the Vietnam War and the whole development of what was called the Catholic left back then. And the other book uh, that I'm going to uh, actually quote from briefly uh, is called A 21st Century Revolution Through Higher Love, Racial Justice, and Democratic Cooperation. Um, you can find out information about both of those at my personal website, which is tedglick.com, just my name.com. So the Supreme Court, um, yeah, just uh, to, remi to remind us all, um, as I see it, there were like, uh, I guess, pretty much the last couple of months of June, um, four particularly significant decisions that showed very clearly 
uh, the, what the, what's going to be uh, continuing for uh, some period of time to come. Uh, unless uh, Clarence Thomas up and dies, or maybe he resigns, whatever. So, uh, but we can't count on that. So, um, one of them was, of course, the big one really was Roe versus Wade. I think that that really was, is the most significant in terms of the impacts, the immediate impact. That's a huge, huge thing. And I know what people, I know everybody knows what that means, so I'm not going to go into it, but I think that was the biggest. Um, there were three other decisions that were also significant, although I don't think as big. Um, one of them um, was in, in relationship to guns, where they essentially gave everybody the right um, to uh, carry guns um, just about anywhere, um, uh, which has not been the case uh, in terms of the law. Um, so that definitely, you know, in this, this uh, mad gun culture that we have in this country, uh, not helpful. That's definitely not helpful. And um, then in terms of relig religion, their uh, authorization of this coach out in um, Washington State, I believe, to gather his players and do a, a and basically an evangelical Christian prayer with them at the games, um, th them authorizing that is certainly problematic in terms of um, the separation of church and state and just kind of evangelization of the football players, young football players, uh, another front uh, in kind of the whole political battle in this country. And the last one, and the one that I'm more connected with in terms of my work around the climate crisis, was uh, West Virginia versus the EPA, which was one of the best decisions. Um, it was a bad decision because it took away one of the powers of the EPA to regulate um, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, but it was not a sweeping decision. It was a one particular, um, uh, one particular uh, tool that the EPA uh, used to have, um, which was the uh, a um, regulation of power plants um, and uh, uh, giving them um, limits in terms of how much they could regulate. Uh, I mean, how much they could admit, not regulate. So uh, there, it, it was a bad decision from the standpoint of limiting one of the EPA's powers, but it actually did not specifically address a whole number of other powers that the EPA has had. So. Um, but it was clearly a sign of, of, of the dangers of things to come in terms of this court. And there certainly is reason to believe that from the standpoint of the climate, they could well decide to make it very difficult um, for the EPA or for that matter, uh, other federal agencies um, and even, even the White House in terms of executive orders um, to take action uh, without congressional authorization, congressional approval and so on. Um, which actually does take me to, in terms of, you know, the future where I, I wanted to focus, which is that, you know, the, the, the uh, Supreme Court uh, is a political institution. And I think we all know that it's not, it's not this kind of entity above the law. Or, I mean, it's not this entity that is just concerned with the law and that, you know, is all these rational players, et cetera. It's a political entity. And um, we need a political uh, counter uh, response to it uh, that I think may be uh, already underway. I hope so. I think, again, Roe versus Wade in particular may have been um, the, the, uh, the uh, right wing reactionaries may in the future look back and think, oh, my God, now that was really a mistake. Um, so I see something about turning up my mic, but I think it's turned up. I can't get it any higher. Sorry. Um, the, the thing that we need to do is change, uh, who controls Congress. Um, you know, uh, we need, uh, Democrats, um, to be in control of all three, uh, all the, the two houses of Congress and the white house, which they kind of are right now, but given Joe Manchin and cinema, we know of course that they're really not in the Senate. Um, but you know that that alone isn't what the country needs. I mean, what we need is a a, a significant you know progressive mobilization uh, and a broad alliance, a united front um, that is able to really uh, make up continue to make inroads 
uh, in terms of politics in this country and show that there is a whole different way to go. Um, to me, uh, kind of Bernie Sanders campaigns, you know, I think give, give a, one of the best ideas of, of the potential that we have. Uh, and one of the approaches, one of the tactics that needs to be used, definitely we need to relate to the electoral system and we need people in office who are not uh, racist, uh, reactionary, uh, misogynist, et cetera. Um, and the, we, we also need to have our movement be really visible. It's very important that we continue to go to the streets, do demonstrations, do civil disobedience around any number of issues. It was good to see some of the civil disobedience that happened um, different places uh, after the Roe decision. I think, I think I heard there was something like 180 people arrested at the Supreme Court a few days after that decision. Um, but the one other thing, and this is the last thing I'll say, I don't wanna go on too long. I think if we're going to be successful in uh, kind of re-energizing um, our movement um, um, in the short term and in the long term. The short term means over the next four months leading up to the election, November 8th. Uh, it's critical uh, that we do everything we can to maximize the vote of working class people, low income people, people of color, women, you know, LGBTQ people, et cetera, kind of the alliance that you know is a majority in the country. It just needs to come out and vote. And, and fight the voter suppression and with various um, you know, tactics. But we also need to be about building a movement and really a bit paying attention to, I'd call it the qualitative aspect of our movement. We need a movement culture that's like mutually supportive of one another, um, that takes on issues of, of weaknesses in our, within our movement when it comes to racism and sexism and heterosexism and so on. Um, we have to have a culture that's welcoming to people, that's supportive of people, um, that over time builds more and more leaders. We, we, we need a, a popular education, ways of, of, of raising the understandings and the confidence of people who at this point are not actively involved with us. That's also a very key aspect of it. To me, those are the kinds of things that um, can lead to uh, changes in the Supreme Court. You know, a, if we've got um, more than uh, 50 people in the Senate and control of the House, for example, next year, uh, there could be legislation to uh, increase the number of justices on the Supreme Court um, to change the political dynamics at work. Um, that's that doesn't that's not something for the long term, depending upon what happens in November, that could be much more short short term than I think a, a lot of people think. So that's it. Those that I hope that's helpful. Yeah, Ted, thank thank you very much. Um, that's a great start to our conversation tonight about the overview of, of uh, the impact of the court, um, how that's limiting what could be what we've assumed in the in past years of, of administrative authority and, and, and the whole deal along those lines. Um, do, you, do you have any redirection on, uh, you, you say vote Democrat, but um, that's, that's a shallow and hollow uh, 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 promise and so often, um, at least here in Ohio, because um, we are such a minority that really doesn't really, you can, you can roll to all the Democrats you want, but there's going to be like one third of the, the people making any kind of decisions in Ohio. Um, uh, what, what's another approach <laughs> that we can, we can sort of push towards? And then uh, Mary Jane, we'll get you in. And then Felicia, I'm going to send you some tips that you wanted me to. So I'll, I'll do that real quick. Well, okay. you, you know, there, there's a book uh, that, um, that's uh, called Power Conceives Nothing, that I'd urge people to check out. It came out maybe several months ago, uh, and it's about the experiences uh, primarily of uh, uh, groups uh, on the ground in uh, 2020 who did, who were not Democratic Party groups. They were essentially kind of independent, um, progressive organizations um, with their own independent bases, their own you know decision making processes, and the work that people did um, to you know defeat Trump, right? To defeat Trump, uh, as well as to get you know a number of progressives elected and and other Democrats. 
Um, so uh, I'd, I'd urge people to check that out. Um, we definitely can't just fall into line behind the Democratic Party uh, and the way that they function. It's absolutely essential that there be, um, I, you know, I, I, I would call them independent, progressive organizations, um, movements, um, definitely uh, uh, outside the control of either party, uh, but which then uh, I think in many cases, certainly right now, are going to end up, uh, uh, you know, running candidates in primaries, you know, progressives in pri democratic primaries. Uh, but even if those progressives don't win, ultimately, if it comes down to somebody who's a supporter of Donald Trump or um, DeSantis or uh, one of those types um, versus somebody who uh, is even like a Joe Biden, who's not my favorite president, that's for sure. Uh, you know, we're talking about fascism here. We're talking about the the taking away of basically people's right to vote if they if they get what they they want across the country. Uh, we, we're talking about the the, uh, the making uh, making it illegal to have an abortion, et cetera. That's the agenda that they want to advance, and they've got a Supreme Court um, that will uh, try to make it happen. Um, that's what we're facing, and that and when that's what that's when that's what we're facing, we have to use tactics accordingly. That's how I see it. Thank you, thank you. And so that's sort of where we're we're going to hit our discussions now, um, towards towards. Um, sorry, people are texting me at this. Um, towards where we're going to move as 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 a uh, society, and in Ohio in particular, uh, Mary Jane uh, Borden has had, and she's got a great presentation. Uh, the Dobbs decision really throws this whole uh, national right, so-called, um, to health care back to states. And uh, the cannabis movement has had 60 plus years of dealing with states' rightsism. So uh, go ahead, Mary Jane, and then uh, Felicia will have you come on in after that, okay? And Ted, please stay on it as long as you can. If you got to get to go, we understand. Um, but thank you again for your work over the years. Thank you very much. Thank you. Go ahead, Mary Jane. Okay, can you hear me? Yep, gotcha. Yay, okay. Uh, good evening, everybody. I hope you're not seeing the Democracy for America there. Um, this is my screen. This is a PowerPoint presentation that I put together about uh, cannabis and abortion rights. Now, you might think that they're not related. Well, they're technically not, obviously. But what I noticed when I was looking at some of the things that are happening within the abortion space, it sounded really familiar to me. And the reason is because, uh, yeah, Stephen's right. We've been working for, uh, or, or maybe Marcus once said it, uh, we've been working for uh, 50 years against um, the states that um, the decision, Supreme Court decision through uh, abortion to. And um, I think we'd safely say that uh, the, the cannabis rights movement knows how to navigate that. Okay, so that's what the quirks of my presentation here, the woe is row um, uh, cannabis or activism. Now I have an article, it's a very long article. I started writing this thing and I couldn't stop. So it ended up to be about 11 pages <laughs> and about 5,000 words, but it was very important to me. So I just kept going until I started. I think I said it to Bob and Suzanne, uh, earlier today, and I'm I'm hoping that they post it on the uh, Free Press webpage. So that's the the the, the, the thing I'm looking from. So you, if you want to read the article, uh, hopefully it's posted there, and you can either follow along or you can get it later on. Uh, can I call it Well is Row? Um, and if you don't know me, my name is Mary Jane Gordon. I've worked in this uh, cannabis space for over 40 years, and I've written, I think, 90 plus articles for the Columbus Free Press. So I've, I've been at this a while. And I'll, I was also, just to reiterate here, I was the 2019 recipient of the Libby Award on activism. So I'd like to think I know a thing or two there. So let's get started here real quick, because I don't want to take, take a lot of time. This is a topic that we could go on for days. OK, so what was wrong? Um, let me go back to over here. Okay, why does it want to advance? And Mary Jane, all this, you, your your article, your recent article has been posted. Uh, Suzanne wants you to know that it is up. And so anything that you say is going to be part of that, that article that you just posted. And it's on the free press. 
Fantastic. Thank you so much, Suzanne. Much appreciated. You guys are just so awesome. Okay, what, I, what the structure I gave to this was I started thinking about teachable moments. You know, there's things that um, happen that what do they teach us? And so I came up with 14 of them for this particular presentation. There could, certainly could be more, but let's just work with the 14 right now. So let, let, let's move to it kind of quickly because I, I know there's other people to come to who want to be a part of this. And so let me, let me move this over a little bit here. Okay, so how do we get here? And I think that the first thing we know that we got here because of the Supreme Court decision very recently that basically um, said that uh, Roe versus Wade no longer exists because it's no longer a right. In other words, they took a right away from women to have abortion uh, decided by the families and the women, the doctors themselves, rather as, and now it's gonna be uh, the decision of the state. And so the, how do we get there? We, we, I, like I said, I thought we could look through the window of the war on drugs. Now the war on drugs uh, has been going on since 19, really 70, I believe with the passage of the Controlled Substances Act that put marijuana in the most uh, restricted category called schedule one. And from that cannabis has become over the last 50 years, illegal but then illegal. Legal and illegal. So let's let's I'll get up that more of that in a minute. Okay. So that's what happened about being delegated to 50 states. So what are the there's like say there's like 14 different posts uh teach um what I want to call teachable moments. And so and they both they're kind of both both cannabis and abortion kind of share these kinds of uh, moments, teachable moments. So that's kind of the premise here. So next moment teachable moment number two. Um 20 million people use cannabis. Um, at least monthly. And we know that in Ohio, there are 150,000 patients. There have been 500,000 um, um, physician recommendations. Uh, 20 million people have actually tried cannabis once in their life in the United States. Every time they do that, every time they do that, they're committing a federal crime. Think about that. Abortion is kind of the same way, but it's, yeah, it's just not that only we have. Abortion, I said, affects millions of people with 700,000 uh, 700,000 procedures just last year. And, um, but the constricted legislation there is also being ready to be, is being felt as the, um, uh, this thing rolls out. This is really, really new. This is barely two weeks old, this whole, whole situation we're in with abortion. Okay, so next teachable moment is history. Now, both cannabis and, can and, and abortion maintain, believe it or not, rich histories. Now, we know cannabis goes back some 8,000 years. Um, in 17, what was it, 1716 or something like that, 1711, the, um, it, was, it, it was mandated to grow it in, um, then in Jamestown. You had to grow, it was mandated by the, by the crown to grow, to grow basically hemp in Jamestown. Um, there was, there's, there's all kinds of, it's, it's foundational uh, with, with respect to cannabis. You know, it, it's gone in, in the 1800s, it was uh, discovered, it was put in the pharmacopoeia then because it thought it was, it, it, there was papers that's published that show it, it, it cured so many diseases. Then in 1941, it was removed from the pharmacopoeia because of reefer madness. And today we're still fighting those same battles. Um, abortion, um, well, it, it, it actually goes up. I mean, assault, let's face it, people. Okay, be honest here. As long as there's been people, there have been abortions. Let's, let's be honest here. You know, so it goes back to like the beginning of time. And uh, there, there, there's, it, there's the, the, um, the, the Greeks, the Romans, the ancient Babylonians all had someplace uh, written about abortion and the, the uh, medications, if you want to call it that, the, the combined combination of herbs and, and, and different things that would create abortifacients. I'm not sure I'm even pronouncing that right, but those are drugs that, that uh, cause abortions. So this has been going on. And I think it's really fascinating. Here's Benjamin Franklin. You know, uh, uh, Justice Alito wants to tell us that there was nothing about abortion, about abortion in the... Um, Constitution when the Bill of Rights was written, and you know, first of all, back then women didn't have rights. They're more more like chattel than anything else. They had no rights, and they didn't have a presence in society other than that. But here's the thing: Benjamin Franklin wrote the standard board efficient recipe that employed, it was employed to the colonial times. So don't tell me that abortion wasn't a subject matter when the Constitution was written. That's BS. 
All right, so popular sport, let's move on to the popular sport, the next teachable moment. And both issues have really substantial major majority uh, um, pop in terms of their polling and their popularity amongst, amongst the, um, the, the, the bunch of Americans, really, when they do public opinion polls. And they found that, uh, you know, for example, medical marijuana is supported by over 90%. I mean, the public just accepts it now. Uh, adult use cannabis, 68%, the highest ever in the Gallup poll. Abortion, 85% of Americans, 85% want to have abortion legal in some way. And only 13%, we have that number there, 13% want to see it completely outlawed. I mean, talk about your minority. And I say here, and I, I hate to get part of it, but come on, this is where we're at. The Republican Party holds a decidedly minority opinion. They're the 13%, all right? Well, actually, here we have 20%, if you want to call it that. 70% of Democratic voters call themselves poor choice. 75% 70 of, of the uh, Republicans want to identify themselves as um, you know, pro-life, aka anti-abortion. So let's move on. All right, next next moment. I'm not seeing this because somebody else is put there. Okay, let's put the X that out. Okay, zealotry. Now this is, I think, one of the most important I point I make in my analysis is because it seems to me that the same zealots who put in place the drug war are the same zealots who are now putting together all these draconian laws with regard to abortion. Now, with regard to drugs, as you may or may not know, if you're old enough to remember, surely all of us remember just say no, you know, back in the day. And know that we had over, oh, I want to say about 100,000 people easily, 500,000 people in jail on drug charges. Even today, even today, we're populating our jails with people who are nonviolent drug offenders. All right. And they're, they're pushing these, and I, it's like, it's almost like, like a whack a mole. You know, the, heart, the more some uh, issue comes about, the more we're going to create a law against it, whack, we're going to make, get, you know, get it to go, to go away. But um, that, that necessarily doesn't work. And like I say, see here, the, the abortion zealots have introduced 541 abortion restrictions just this year in the states, 541. And, and and here's the thing that this um oh what was his name i just i missed his name he was just talking to us before but he was talking about about what what that we need to elect democrats well here's here's the rub if the republicans take over in 2022 and particularly in 2024 that mcconnell will have a national abortion ban and that this crap that we have in ohio will be nationwide and uh, we can't allow that to happen. We as women, I don't know how many women are here tonight. We as women cannot allow that to happen because it, we're, we're at the episode. We have a target on our backs on this one, okay? And so, so but, but not only that, okay? This is a women's issue, clearly. Guys, you know, <laughs> you kind of feel weird when guys talk like in about it, you know? Uh, but, but this also goes to race. Just like the drug war, all right? Because the drug war is, is really uh just really unbalanced when it comes to the race uh, black people and white people do drugs at just about the same rates but black people are the ones that are occupying our jails and black people are the ones that are on probation for drugs and black people are the ones that get sanctioned they can't get a house they can't get a car they can't get a professional license and things like that that might require you know a drug test or something like that we'll get that in a minute and so um, they, 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 when Nixon started the uh, drug war in, in two, uh, 1975, he wasn't out to put people in jail, believe it or not. He wanted to give them treatment and he wanted to eliminate mandatory minimum sentences. And the God of exactly this, the, 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 this is the thing about these zealots. They're not satisfied just to get what they want. They got to take the next step, the next step, the next step, escalate it to the point where everybody's in jail. Yes, I don't know. So um as i said this th that's what we're talking about here at the bottom point here despite the fact that lower use of blacks are four times more likely to be arrested for marijuana and six times more likely to be incarcerated okay and it's medicine now we know already know medical marijuana is medicine i mean I, I think i've devoted my life to it and i think i don't think i need to sit around and convince you guys that cannabis is medicine we we don't need to do that but it's interesting to me 
that over time, the things that we want to make illegal, and you know, abortion being one of them, are actually medical issue, issues that turned out to be, to be beneficial. You know, now we know, as they say now, that cannabis can cure a whole wide range um, and, and treat, I should say, a whole wide range of, of, of conditions. I will testify here. I used cannabis to treat cancer. I did not take chemotherapy. Um, and I, I'm going to say I don't have cancer anymore, but it's worked for two years. All right. So that's the difference here. Now, back in 1970, when we passed the Controlled Substances Act, they thought, well, we're going to get, drug, get rid of drugs here within a certain period of time. We were not. We're, they're still with us, very much still with us, right? And a lot of it's because they say they have medical qualities and, and some of the abortion drugs that, that are used for, um, to, t- to treat, to, to, to basically create an abortion are actually like cannabis, treat cancer, treats lung cancer. So we want to get rid of those, of course, you know. But I like the statement here by the Medical College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. I think they're probably really on the, um, got the, the gun basically pointed at that site because the people go to jail when, uh, if, if, when these abortion laws are enforced. So I, I really like their statement. There. You can, I'll let you read it later. Okay, and here's the other, another thing is, and I, I love this rhetorical question. Why is it that some of the safest human activities involved in the most legal and controversial and can zealously contested political footballs? Both abortion and cannabis are deemed safe, all right? But they got the zealots out there selling them with this illegal, illegality and wanting to ultimately, I think, put people in jail, wanting to, to basically hurt hurt women and, and hurt, hurt, the, hurt um, sick people, all right? That's it's sick, but it almost seems like what they want to do. Staying pregnant is more dangerous than having an abortion. Think about it that way. Okay, the next one. Number nine, typically with both of these kind of zealot driven issues, the punishments don't fit, fit the crime, you know? Um, <sighs> I, I don't think I need to be, be uh, really describe that too much. The drug war has cost us uh, since 1970 a trillion dollars, and the adult. And then we've got the with the anti-drug deal. We have um, probably eight, I'd say 800,000 people, even with illegal states, will probably be arrested this year for cannabis. You know, and um, the rest of incarcerations will continue. There's still people in jail in federal prison. For marijuana and this is the direction i think the the zealots want to take us we will we want to uh put women which will put gynecologists in jail for doing abortions all right and check out here this check out high high school eight uh, 598 uh cause an abortion would be a fourth degree felony and if promoting abortion like i'm talking here tonight about abortion they might, I could be accused of pro, pro, promoting it, and that would be a first degree felony. That's Ohio. That's Ohio. All right. And then the enforcement, and, and enforcement is never, never fair. It's never fair because people we know with money and connections can always get out of the drug charge. Who do they send to jails? The poor and the minorities because they don't can't fight back as harshly as, as the wealthy can. All right, and, and they go stand be far beyond their top, their, 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 the the far beyond what the topic is. Now, I think this is important to note for, for women out there. Um, so far, there are no drug tests. Really, the thing that got the drug war going that really accelerated was the ability to detect marijuana and cocaine and all these other drugs in Europe. Who, who, who among us would have thought in 1970 that to get a job, You'd have to pee in a cup. I mean, have we lost our minds? You know, no, I, this is why this is an important point here. So far, there are no chemical tests that could prove someone having a portion yet. Now, like I say, in 1970, we never envisioned drug testing. And there's probably some scientists, so quasi scientists out there right now trying to figure out, hmm, how could I detect abortion in women so that what? We could put them in jail. Or, treat them all right number 11 
Now here's where we come to the states. And the states are indeed the laboratories of democracy. And maybe right now we should be so thankful that we do live in a country that has states because if we were living, in, if we just had one federal government, we'd all be screwed, okay? And so um, that, that does mean that, that all the 50 states will treat abortion differently, just like all 50 states treat cannabis differently. But that good thing is that they do treat it differently. We can have an Illinois, we have a California, we have a New York that will still be very supportive of women and very supportive of reproductive, uh, reproductive rights. Uh, not so much. Uh, Ohio, really a poor example in all these situations. Um, I'll go into that in a minute. So, um, but here, here's, here's the thing about the drug war. Now, in, 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 in Idaho, if I have three ounces of cannabis, I get either I could be sentenced to five years in prison and a ten thousand dollar fine. Now I'm going to carry that three ounces to Michigan. No fine, no time, nothing. Even in Ohio, if I have three ounces here as a medical marijuana patient, which I am, no fine, no time. Now that's just not right, is it? I mean, that's what we're going to run into when these get these some of these states like Idaho, very conservative. They'll, they'll, I think they're one of going to be the first in line for those complete bans, you know, at conception, which is really a problem. And I think I'm going to dovetail here with what my prior gentleman was saying about how this, what the solutions are. And I think the solutions lie in activism. Of course, I'm going to say that because I've been an activist of 40 years. But I do think that it worked. Look at what it worked even with Ohio. You know, 10 years ago, we didn't have, if I had my three ounces of marijuana, I could be. I, I think it would still be somewhat decriminalized, but it would still probably land me a little much higher fine and maybe a little bit of jail time because uh, it would be like 200 grams or more. But, you know, now um, the, we, we have, um, because of the activism of me and the, the organization, I've, the, Bob and Suzanne and you guys with the free press, in particular, I want to recognize Bob for all the help that he's given us. I mean, we, we, we stood on his shore so many times. And I think we can count the fact that we have a law in Ohio that passed in 2016. We're looking at possibly passing adult use in 2023. Uh, we can thank the activists, particular people like Bob and Kenny Schwerker, the people who, who came before us, who laid the groundwork to where we are now. And that was due to activism. Um, and he, we are, I've outlined in a minute of this, the part of the, with the solution. So I'd like to note that there are, there are moving in the direction that I think they should, because there are uh, 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 issues on the ballot, as they say, in Arizona, California, Michigan, South Dakota, and Vermont, that will say that, you know, abortion is right, or however they word it, uh, that women have a right to private and health care with regard to how they uh, handle their reproduction situations. Okay, so next one. And here I'm talking about the, the tools of tools of trade, the tools of my trade, tools of my trade here. Statewide ballot issues. Uh, that's what we we're talking about just a minute ago. That was uh, 2000. <laughs> we ran all kinds of ballot issues back in the day 10 years ago. Uh, but we do have one coming up in 2023 that could put adult use on ballot. Local dec I want to recognize the local decrimination, decriminalization because they operate on the home rule principle. And I, I, I totally admire these people because they're actually going into the grassroots communities and passing really small initiatives. But as they're doing it, they're going to very conservative areas of the state and they, they see it with, with correct, accurate information about cannabis and lower their resistance to the larger issue of legalizations that we may see in 2023. So that's really important to get out there and get signatures from your small, medium, large local communities that add to the pile to the momentum that we end up with passing a state, statewide law or ballot issue. Uh, lobbying, certainly that we that I've done called on the legislators many, 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 many times. And we need to learn how to do that well, know how to make those connections. Personal patient stories, um, I'm personally a part of a, a group called the Courage in Cannabis, one of 18 authors that told our stories, and it's now an Amazon bestseller. And so I think these personal patient stories are absolutely critical so that people have a sense of who actually who these people are. They're not strangers. They're not, they're not, you know, people out there. They're, they're your wife. They're your brother, you know, your, 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 your cousin, your sister, your, your daughter, you know, those stories are so powerful.
earned media. Um, some people say you have to pay for media. Well, I don't think we've ever paid a dime for media, but I've given over 500 media interviews. I've been featured by the, all, all the major television stations in Ohio. Uh, I could go on and on of that, uh, but it's free and you learn how to do it and you can get before the, because the, the, the media will, will most of the time will, will just suck this thing up. They love this stuff. Uh, internet communication, that means Facebook groups and knowing how to put up uh, press releases, posts on, on different, you know, all these different Facebook pages. You can have Facebook groups, things like that to organize and get your message out. Funding is very important. Funding is essential. And be critical because ballot issues could cost $20 million or more. But nonetheless, um, there, you still have to have, even though you activists are underpaid or paid at all, you still have to have money to pay for, you know, internet and brochures and things like that. So you need money to do that. And I truly think, again, I'm going to recognize Bob and Suzanne, the work that you, has been done at the Free Press to get our message out there um, 90 times for me, not because I've written 90 plus articles. And uh, now that has really helped in a major sort of way to, to get that out in the public space. The free press is what I'm understanding here is only independent uh, media in, in, the, in Columbus. And so everything else is going to go through the filter of the dispatch or what have you. Here, the message is going to get out in an honest way. And, um, and here, finally, and I think your, our prior presenter said it's vote. Vote, vote, vote. But vote in an intelligent sort of way. Find out who these candidates are. Find out if they're, what their positions on cannabis. Find out if positions on abortion. And I'm telling you this. If there's a candidate who's against abortion, uh, if there's a candidate who's against cannabis, chances are they'll also be against abortion. One and the same. All right. So let's see. Finally, um, I want. I wrote this when I wrote this article. I kind of finished it on the Fourth of July, but I didn't get it published until today. But I used it as the Fourth of July as the um, date on the article because we were celebrating the Declaration of Independence and its statement. You know, we were entitled "Rights Inalienable Rights," Supreme Court of Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Happiness. And uh, a survey showed, recent survey showed that 38 percent, only 38 percent of Americans now feel that uh, they feel that way, feel that they can, that, 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 that this speaks to them. You know, they're, they've been disenfranchised from our, 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 our Declaration of Independence and, and our Constitution. But these rights, regardless, still belong to the citizens. They belong to me. They belong to the abortion providers, the women who are having abortions, the medical doctors who are, who are taking care of. And they belong to all of us as females. They belong to all of us as people of the United States. You know, let's never forget that. That's about where you're about. That is core to, excuse me, core to us. So question is, question for everybody, are legalized kids and legalized abortion so egregious that the United States should abandon, abandon the rights that is historically valued? Really? Really? Okay. So finally, final message here is one thing I do know about the war on drugs is it doesn't work. You know, these, these, the, these uh, prohibitionists will go out there and you know, they'll try, they'll try everything they possibly can. They'll ignore the support, the prevalence, the history, the safety, the racism. They, they, they'll, they'll try to increase penalties uh, and, and nothing, not, not even that will assuage them. But in the end, they will fail. They will fail. So it, 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 it's not support, it's too expensive, it's too divisive, it's, it's wrong, it's morally wrong, there's all them are reasons, but it, like the war on drugs, it takes a while, we're almost there, we've got 37 states that have legal marijuana, 19 have adult use, we're talking about uh, legalizing psychedelics now, we're talking to get rid of uh, you know, drug, drug penalties in many, many ways, and some, some um, district attorneys aren't even enforcing those laws anymore. So we're moving towards that, that bright future. But we do have our values. But like I like to say, right now, it seems really, really dire. But the light I see ahead of us is that this is going to fall. I think personally for abortion, it's going to fall fairly quickly. I think there's some positions that are really untenable. I could go and talk about that, but I, I'm going to try to avoid that because they're just so ugly. Um, but I think that it's going to fail pretty quickly. Uh, and so that's, that's the message I take from the war on drugs. But remember... Those who fail to learn from history are condemned to repeat it. And, and I think that's all I have to say. Mary Jane, oh, I know that 
That's my thing. Thank you so much. That's not all you have to say, but thank you for writing your article and your 90 articles for Columbus Press. And that is, we always want to push out at the salon is that people are asked to write and be part of the, the writers and the community of free press. And Mary Jane, you have been one of the most diligent in, in, in documenting the movement uh, for freedom uh, uh, in the United S in Ohio, particularly but in the United States in general, um, and Columbus, right ahead. Uh, so thank you so much. And so um, let's continue this conversation. I, I think and join in, Mary Jane. You, you please jump in as you want. Ted, I think had to go. He said he was going to leave. But Felicia, um, we're going to bring you in now. Your work. Um, hello. Hello. Thank you for being here tonight. Your work. Uh, has been on a lot of different fronts and i know you're sort of newer to columbus but you've been in columbus for a while your activism started other places and and maybe talk a little bit about that as well as where you where you got into activism and, and that whole thing too but uh more particularly right now let's start with your your work that you're doing now on the equality act and other other aspects of that thank you for being here too Oh, well, thank you for inviting me. And hello, everyone. Can you hear me OK? Yep. 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 OK, good. Uh, I'm using Bluetooth because I can hear clearer. <laughs> um, yeah, so my name is Felicia, and I have been, I've been in activism my entire adult life. Um, I lived in California for a really long time. And when I was just getting into college out of high school was around the same time that uh, things were happening in LA. Um, where basically LA, we watched LA burn and uh, we did a lot of supportive protests and marching in support of, uh, of human rights and marginalized folks at Berkeley and in different areas. Um, mostly uh, what I have done as an activist in my life is uh, stand with marginalized groups, typically it's poor and uh, persons of color, uh, but also the LGBTQ community. I am a Romani person, so I came out of a very closed community that is highly marginalized and erased in the United States and highly discriminated outside of the United States. Uh, so it's one way for me to um, do something for human rights, even though I can't specifically help my people in the US because the big fight is in Europe, I can do something to help folks that are in similar situations. Um, I am an educator, so I teach, oh, I work with high school kids, um, junior through uh, graduation, and then with college kids up through postgraduate. Uh, I do some youth mentoring of younger littles, and um, so I do, uh, I do a lot of work with youth, and my focus as an activist these days is mostly youth advocacy in uh in conjunction with uh the rights of people who are marginalized or, or don't have a voice on a public platform so i try and take i uh, try and do what i can I'm, I'm the grunt i am on the ground i've i've been shot two different times at protests i've been maced more times than i can count and i go out there every single time because it's the only way that people are gonna the, the populace is going to listen because I'm constantly surprised at how little the average person actually knows about the state or country that they live in as far as the mechanics and uh, the politics behind it. Groups like yours obviously have your finger on the pulse and are paying more attention, but that's not a lot of people, uh, especially if you're talking about people that have some sort of established privilege. If we're talking financial privilege, if we're talking racial privilege, some kind of privilege that puts them into a bubble and they sort of stop engaging in the larger world's, uh, in the larger world's conversation and, and activity because they don't feel they have to anymore because they personally are no, no longer have any stakes in the game. And that is something that I'm fighting against because everybody needs to be paying attention, you know, and that's my personal opinion on that. As far as, um, the activism I've been doing since I've been in Ohio. I came to Ohio about 11 years ago, and um, 11, almost 12 years ago. And I had been uh, living in Chicago for a short stint because uh, um, professionally I'm an artist and I do my teaching as sort of a balanced financial base point. Uh, base point. So then 
you know, all of this is what I do on my own time. Um, anyway, uh, so, you know, we're talking about everything going on with the Supreme Court and losing rights for abortion. And there are a lot of other things on the chopping block. Um, you know, there are things that are affecting uh, the queer community, especially trans and non-binary people. They're, the, they're under the spotlight right now uh, because they make conservative people uncomfortable because uh, having a conversation about gender identity forces people to step out of their comfort zone and reevaluate re their own gender identity and their own sexuality. And most folks don't like that. So they react poorly to those kind of conversations. There's a lot of um, bad information. Um, there's a lot of misrepresentation and uh, not a lot of visibility in the correct way. Uh, so these, uh, this group gets a bad shake. What has been going on in, especially in June, were a series of bills that were going through that were, they were using the gender conversation, you, you were referring to them as zealots. These zealots were using uh, the gender conversation and what's going on there as a wedge to, in my opinion, get control over groups of people that uh, these conservative people feel threatened by for whatever reason or another. They're threatened by women who have autonomy over their own bodies and their own lives. They're threatened by people who make, uh, who step outside of what they consider the typical norm and love whoever they want to love uh, freely and, uh, you know, decide for themselves who they are and how they best can have the highest quality of their own life. What always baffles me is why folks think it's their business. You know, uh, I live by the three F's. If you're not funding me, feeding me, or fucking me, you don't get an opinion on my life. I'm sorry, you just don't. And the fact that people think that they, that they do is absurd, always has been. What has gotten me ticked off was that they sneaked in. Uh, there, was, um, there was a bill that went through, which was um, number 61, it was, it, the bulk of it was for something innocuous, but they snuck in um, at the last minute a piece of it that makes it that if this now gets voted on and gets passed, makes it legal for any adult, any adult, if they don't believe a child, and I say child because this is like K through 12, if a student in school if they declare themselves to be female or male and an adult does not believe their declaration, they have the right to examine their genitals. That is state-sanctioned pedophilia. That is state-sanctioned assault on minors. What the actual fuck? This is something that made it through uh, the bill process and is now being on the table to be voted into potentially being a law here in Ohio. This is disgusting. I say this as an educator. I say this as someone that works with the youth very closely. I cannot believe that that went through. Now, throughout June, I was with, uh, I helped organize several protests. We were doing disruption while the uh, people at the state house were deliberating over specific uh, specific bills. There was the anti-abortion bill. There's actually two different ones. Uh, there was uh, the bill that is the, the don't say gay, don't say race bill, right? Which was basically whitewashing history in the classroom. So you can't talk about queer history. You can't talk about black history or any kind of marginalized history. Anything that makes America look less than great, they don't want it being taught in the school. Uh, the one that went through in Alabama, for example, I, as an educator, if I want to talk about, I don't know, Harvey Milk and his historical contribution to that area in Northern California, I could potentially spend up to 10 years in a federal prison because I did that just for talking about it in class. If a student were to come up to me and say, hey, I'm not safe at home, um, but you're my safe place, my safe person, and I need to talk about my my orientation or my gender identity, I have to tell out them to their parents. I grew up abused. I can tell you straight, straight, uh, straight from personal experience that that will put a child's life at risk. Uh, 
If anything, it raises the bar for suicide ideation and self-harm, and not, not to mention ostracization and bullying within schools. So these bills that are going through collectively, if you look at this, in my now that this is me doing a little bit of crackerjack analysis uh, based on personal experience and what I'm observing, right? I'm not a dumb person. I've been around the block a few times and I'm paying attention like you guys. You have these different bills that are coming up. The only folks who are not affected by the current legislation that is happening state to state to state are cisgendered white men, heteronormative men. Everyone else is under direct attack. They're starting this ball rolling by using the current popular target of transgendered people. They use that as a way to also push the overturning of Roe versus Wade, because not only does this directly affect anyone with a functioning uterus uh, in the realm of their autonomy, whether or not they get to be pregnant, want to be pregnant, or want to end being pregnant for a variety of very intelligent reasons, assault, incest, um, the mother could potentially die if this doesn't go, or if the, if the fetus implants in the wrong place. They weaponize Christianity and other religious uh, ideology to protect themselves under the Constitution for basically being a well-funded hate group. When we know that anyone who has read these books knows that they don't have a, they don't have any scriptural grounding to stand on, right? They're just making up stuff because no one's going to challenge them because they're wrapping themselves in this kind of dialogue. And it it threatens to push back um, interracial marriage, same sex marriage. It it puts back uh, the femini feminist movement back by 50 years or more. This is a snowball effect. This is the very beginning of a larger objective to take a lot of control over the populace. Why is this? Conservative folks feel threatened by people speaking their mind. They feel threatened by people having autonomy. They, have, they feel threatened by people being able to communicate freely online with each other and talk about things that dismantle their power in some way. Most of the times it's financial. A lot of times it has to do with um, fragile egos of a much older generation. I mean, there's multiple things you could look at that you could say, it's this, it's that, when really it's all of it. And it's all coming to a head. So I have been going out doing these protests and rallying people to do disruptive work. Um, we had some success. There was, a, there was, they were, doing for 616 and 454, which takes away healthcare for children, gender affirming care, um, which the, these, the idea that the state thinks it has the right to tell parents how to raise their children is obnoxious, that they would think to force doctors to go against their Hippocratic oath and all of that. I mean, the, the, the sheer unconstitutional attitude they're trying to get away with is actually reminiscent of uh, when the civil rights movement was going on and they ended the Jim Crow law. Well, what did the states do on the state level? They tried to keep pushing segregation and other racist laws on the state level to maintain what they felt was their power and the status quo. The only way that this got dealt with was there was a, fed a federal protection put in place that prevented the states from continuing to do what they deemed unconstitutional activity so that that segregation could stop. And obviously, racism did not stop, but you know it was one step, right? And at the very least, it prevented people from openly segregating. What the government is doing now, because they are seeing these states popping up with these individual things like criminalizing marijuana, criminalizing abortion, and taking away bodily autonomy from queer folks and people with functioning uteruses and trans-identified people and people of color. Um, like, like Mary Jane was mentioning, this, this has a disproportionate effect on people in the BIPOC community, but also people who live below the poverty line, because you and I both know, or we all well know, that anybody with enough money and enough power can get whatever they want, whenever they want, and the law doesn't necessarily touch them. But those of us below the poverty line, that if I don't work today, I don't eat tomorrow, don't have that choice. And if we are barred from doing things that take care of our physical well-being, our mental well-being, our emotional well-being, what does that do? It, it cripples us and it keeps us down. 
Um, that's me being a little bit conspiracy theory, but it seems so obvious and clear that it's hard to avoid. So with these protests that we were doing, trying to get people to see exactly what is going on and see the bigger picture, we did disruption. And one of the things that we did that I thought was pretty good was towards the middle part of June, right before um, our state house people went on vacation, they had we had uh, we got um, we got Gary Click to get so frustrated while he was presenting his case that he kept forgetting words. He got really ticked off, popped off at the mouth, yelled at the chairperson, and got thrown out. Um, three of the of the people there that were uh, testifying in favor of these bills just left. They said, nope, not doing this, can't handle it, they left. That's because we had people on the inside feeding us information in real time and we stood under the windows of them while they were having their, uh, their deliberations at full volume, screaming at them our retorts in actual time, uh, it, to the point where they actually cut the feed to the Ohio channel on their third set of meetings. That felt pretty good as a, as a grunt, as an on the ground activist, because I actually saw us making, uh, making an impact in real time, which is rare, I feel. What ended up happening was there was a lot of us that were feeling this is, an un this is one of those battles that you can't just win, and especially on the state level. So what do we do? How do we go above their head? What can we do? And we were thinking about what was going on within um, the, social, the civil rights movement. And there was a team of people in Arizona that got four delegates from all 50 states to go to DC and speak before um, the congressional hearings, each for their own state. So I and three other people got put in front of uh, Senator Sherrod and his, and his team. And I basically point blank said, I'm like, um, if you wanna go down in history as the pedophilia Senator, then by all means, don't do anything about what the hell is going on in your own state. Cause it doesn't feel like you're paying much attention. And he didn't know what the hell I was talking about. So I had to talk to him about what I was just mentioning. These different bills that they're trying to push through, the, the bill that went through that basically legalizes assault on minors in school, right? I mean, does anyone else just infuriated by that? Because the very idea is so disgusting I can't stand that. I was an abused kid. I really can't stand that. That our one job is to protect the sanctity of our children, give them the space to figure out their own shit and grow into healthy, well-adjusted people, not try and indoctrinate them into whatever we think and force them to be some other way that they're not. That's abuse. No matter how you want to word it, that is, that is abuse and that needs to stop. So I was saying this to Sherrod and our group that was there, we went in with a stack of testimony from other people who had something to say about these different bills, and we presented our own testimony. We talked for two hours and a half, and the people on his team, our former teachers, and all of them were appalled at this kind of stuff. So what they told us was that there is an act that is being currently, it got pushed out of the um, committee stage and is now on the floor being voted on to see if it can go forward. And it's called the um, Fairness and Equality Act for All Americans. And it is effectively a reimagining of the Equal Rights Amendment that never passed. It's contemporized. And what they've, what they've done and what we were talking about was instead of saying, this will protect LGBTQ, BIPOC community, uh, people with functioning uteruses, instead of actually listing any special interest groups because these conservative deep bags are going to say, well, we can't do that because of this belief, or we can't help those people because of A, B, and C. We took that dialogue out of the language, and it's literally, if you are a citizen of the United States, you deserve to be treated on an equal playing field across the board, period. That's what this act would do. What this act does is it dismantles all of these bills that are trying to go through on the state level in the same way that they dismantled that during the civil rights movement after the pull and the removal of the Jim Crow law. So they're trying to get this done on the, on the federal. Now, I know a lot of us don't have faith in the federal, but it's a, it's a ray of hope. And then shortly after, uh, the president did an executive order that I would say hobbled those uh, those state uh, bills because now you know they, they they can't function the way that they're designed. They're going to have to either end them or dramatically rewrite them in some way that fits these parameters. It's a stay of execution and a pause for as long as the president is the president. We're pushing for this federal act to do a grand sweep 
so that at the minimal, it can continue as a current status quo. Meanwhile, we're still doing our protests on the ground and trying to make the best of a bad situation and trying to get the states to pay attention to the people instead of just endlessly talking out of their rectums as eloquently as they do. Uh, we have, for example, there's a protest coming up on the 16th that is national and all throughout Ohio. There's a group of us that are doing it, which is for um, basically for 454 and 616 because there's still a major concern and states are still trying to push these things. And uh, I've been helping to organize that. But what we are looking at trying to do is to think outside the box. So this is the thing I wanted to bring to the table today. There's um, in the realm of abortion, for example, I had uh, read some time ago, and I was actually, while we were all talking, I was looking it up just to verify Switzerland has one of the lowest incidences, incidences of abortion to the point where it's almost a non-issue. Why? Because they enforce mandatory sex education. Our big problem in the United States is that you don't get either. You don't get sex education for kids when they are becoming sexually aware of their own bodies and you're criminalizing abortion. You can't have it both ways. At the end of the day, if you have kids being taught proper sex education from the get-go, they grow into young adults that can make a, a very educated decision on whether or not they engage in sex, and if so, how to prevent themselves from getting pregnant in the first place. With a lot of the issues of youth getting pregnant, it's because they did not know better, and they only were able to learn about sex by watching porn online. These kids got their own sex education, whether people allow it or not. That's the reality of human existence. So instead of being like, oh, just abstain and that's the end of it, because all of us here know that doesn't work. People are people and people, if they want to get it on, are going to get it on. And then if they have to lie about it, they're going to lie about it, but they're going to get it on. And kids are doing it as young as 13 and 12 currently. So you have 11, 12, 13 year old uh, girls that are coming up pregnant and they're inspected to bear that child and then what? You know, so if you have proper sex education, like, and this is what they did in Switzerland, the rate of, uh, of unwanted pregnancies dropped by 85%, 85%. You took the, you took the, um, the one thing off the table with proper education. In my mind, proper education on these kinds of things is a way to circumnavigate the people who have dug their heels into the ground and say, no abortion, no abortion, um, you know, unconcealed gun carry everywhere you go. You Okay, if you don't want to do gun control, how about bullet control? Put, put friggin' uh, serial numbers on all the bullets, and who, when you buy the bullets, you have to register the serial numbers. If a crime happens with a bullet that matches your serial number, guess what? You're the one going to jail. Have all the guns you want. Be accountable for your bullets. Rethink solutions think outside the box so what we've been doing on the ground is doing exactly that how else can we come at this if we can't go at this through the front door what about climbing to the second floor and going in through a window what about going through the back door what i mean what about going through the storm doors there's another way to make a mark and get these things stopped or altered in a way that doesn't completely screw the populace and the underserved communities and the people who don't have the money to properly get what they need in a safe and healthy way, right? Thank you, Felicia. Thank you. Thanks. Thank that you. was my part. <laughs> oh, no, that's great. And, and keep keep talking. And, and um, the one thing that the dispatch, Columbus Dispatch, you know, it's one of our our local media uh, did mention uh, the vulnerable uh, populations that are going to be impacted by the recent Dobbs decision and uh, the, the economics is going to be playing out and, and how how would how would the Fairness and Equality Act deal with the economic uh, impact of a lot of these policies and Wendy met, mentioned you know there's an ongoing concern about the ERA you know the uh, Equal Rights Amendment that has stalled for 40 50 years or whatever yeah yeah so um, uh, we're, we're in a very new world in a lot of ways because a lot of us use the courts 
and the federal uh, legisl authority to uh, push civil rights and other issues in the past. Now we're in a, in a, in a very precarious situation where local, state, federal um, uh, checkpoints are not there. We don't have any checkpoints in our policies right now. And, and, and so Mary Jane, Felicia, and I don't know if uh, 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 Ted's still around or anybody else have what, where, where are we, where can we find the power? I mean, it's in people's power, right? It's the power of the right. people, street action and, and uh, taking over corporate uh, mm -hmm. investments and, and, and trying to figure out that whole thing about what, what this system is going to end up being. I mean, where, where, where are we heading as a society? I, I'm, I'm challenged by where are we heading? Where are we heading as a people in this I mean, in Ohio, Columbus? Columbus has, you know, the, the, the attorney says, but, you know, he, he's not really touching anything because the law says um, all of anybody that's uh, brought up about providing health care it's, it's a federal crime, not misdemeanor, and all Klein can do is misdemeanor. So, you know, his his promise of not prosecuting is sort of a hollow claim. And what you know, a lot of the Democrats have that hollowism. They 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 pump their chest that they're going to do something, but they don't do anything. They they can't do anything. They're not in the power. They're not. So how how do we uh, address this? I know people power is what we always go back to and people media. And again, please write uh, for the free press. All y'all, please, you guys are so erudite in your in your concepts that we need more and more and more articles put out and, and, and to adjust this this future that we, we, we're in a challenge for. So please, Mary Jane, <laughs> Or Felicia, or anybody. Um, I threw out there a lot, but go ahead. Well, I mean, I I could I could jump in for a minute here. Like a lot of what, just in my own lifetime, I'm gonna be I'm I'm 48, and just in my own lifetime, You're I have puppy. watched certain. Puppy. You're, that? A puppy. You're a puppy. I, I'm. Am I a puppy? Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice. Well, even in my own lifetime, and I haven't lived as long as some of you, but even in my own lifetime through the 70s, through the 80s, through the 90s, I have watched um, the Democratic Party kind of mutate. The Democratic Party right now is more like what the Republican Party was in the 70s and 80s, in my personal opinion, as far as how they function, whereas the current Republican Party is, I don't know, a friggin' clown car. It's, a, it's, it's so far removed and so far extreme, but it's directly influenced by the rise of the Christian right, which we saw in the, what was it, like the mid-late 80s, when they suddenly started taking, uh, taking some, some power on a more political level. And what I am seeing is an inf infiltration of what is being called Christian ideals, but if you actually read the scripture, as many of us have, it's not, uh, but they are using that as a wedge and they're using that to assert control. I mean, how do you best control a people through their spiritual beliefs, through their own fears and misgivings, through misinformation? It's a, it's, it's, it's a time old tactic. And what we can do as people, I mean, when we talk about voting and we say, get the vote out there, really, what is it like a quarter of our country is what actually votes most of the time? If Maybe. that, Maybe, maybe this year it's going to be. I mean, it's not high, but it, it's. Yeah. I'd say fit, depends on the election. Fifty-six percent. If you're talking about off uh, your elections, let's say uh, the 2022 midterms, I would say probably thirty percent. Yeah. Okay. So, but thirty percent of the entire country. So that's between seventy. That's like fifty to seventy percent of people who are not voting or are not able to vote for whatever reason because they're not they don't have that accessibility. So I think a big part of it is finding ways to get uh, to get voting to the underserved communities, the poor communities, the uh, BIPOC communities that are being barred or being prevented in some kind of way from actually getting to the polls or getting the information they need to vote properly would be my best guess because what the country is currently doing is we are backsliding. We're backsliding in a big way because there was a pendulum shift 
right? We had, if you're talking like maybe 30% of the country ever ever really making a decision, you had 30% of the country that was more on a liberal lean, and now you've got 30% of the country that is more on a conservative lean that is running the show. They they are cock blocking the, the, the Democratic Party and preventing them on every single level from pushing forward with any of the things that they're trying to do, even though they're trying to do these things. So we have to, as a people, Increase the amount of people who vote from like 30% to, I don't know, 100? Can we get anywhere near that number? Where actually a more representation of the country's voice can be heard to make more informed decisions. The other part of it is with free press, getting unbiased information out there because the press has not been anything but biased for what? Easily 20 years, if not a little more. Yeah, yeah, Felicia, I can't promise us not to be biased, but uh, <laughs> we're, we're for the people, we're for the poor. Uh, the mayor, the mayor wants to say something, so Mayor Motul, uh, please uh, uh, go Hello, ahead. Hello, Mayor. Hi. Actually, I got a question. Uh, when I was at Comfest, uh, I had a long discussion with an individual about two things, and you were talking about thinking outside of the box. And right. one of them was he mentioned uh, that the city of Columbus could be a sanctuary city of abortion for abortion rights and the other was and this is for mary jane uh i wanted to ask you earlier about uh marijuana uh he he's takes medical marijuana and he can't get hired from the city and what would be a good argument based on on trying to be make him allowed to be uh accepted as an employee with the city of columbus even though he uses marijuana but i want to ask felicia first if you what about the sanctuary abortion laws do you know anything about that i mean right now it's it's very much up in the air and nothing has really settled yet because the fight is going pretty strong um we just did several uh, there was that very large protest um for reproductive rights that happens that i think we had a thousand people show up at the state house i mean that was that was impressive you know to see at least that many people show up but I feel like we may not be a sanctuary in Ohio because from what I've been hearing from the house here is that, you know, they're, they're pushing these, these uh, anti-abortion bills and they're trying to roll them back tighter to the point of conception, even though, you know, again, these people who speak through scripture as though they are the authority, scripture would say that first breath. So conception doesn't count, you know, not until after the actual babies popped out. And a lot of our argument is you don't seem to give a crap about people once they're born. But the, the city you, of Columbus an act is, be a sanctuary city to, it, for, for, for abortion protection? I don't, I don't think I, at the moment it doesn't look like we can. Okay. We'd, we'd have to we'd have to put down these these abortion bills, these abortion bans. We'd have to vote them down if we do then we could become a safe place, a camping spot, if you will, for, right. um, for people to come and get something safe and legal. But as most people know, whether or not it's legal, people do abortions. The only thing that they, that they will do is make abortions unsafe. People right. will still get them if they need them, still do them if they feel they must. So at the end of the day, and it isn't just abortions that's getting put on the chopping block here. It's, it's um, Yes, you. If there's something implanted in a fallopian tube, that woman's going to die. That that parent is going to die, and more than likely, the fetus isn't going to survive anyway because it's not in the right spot of the body. So, so what that's what these laws will do is rather than remove that from the tube so that the woman can live and maybe try again if she wants, both uh, both both bodies die, the mother and the, and the unborn fetus because abortion would be illegal, that person can't have her life saved. There are some people who have three kids, get pregnant on accident, even though they were trying to not get pregnant, cannot afford a fourth kid, will be forced to have this kid. And then what, it goes into foster care because we've got like 11,000 foster kids that aren't being adopted. So that's not a good plan. We have to fix foster care, right? So what, what are we supposed to do with these unwanted children? Are we going to force 11 year olds to be parents? Are we going to force people who've been raped by the, by a trusted family member or some horror show from the streets forced to have this, this memory, this trauma constantly that they're responsible to care for? I mean, it's, it's, and at the end of the day, again, body autonomy, a person 
should have the right to decide what is best for that person. And the state, federal level, nobody should have the right to tell anybody otherwise. It's so ridiculous. It is, I mean, it's just ridiculous. And it goes to a place, like you said before, it goes to a place of fascism. And it goes even beyond that because, I mean, this it, we're on a road to a theocracy. And then yeah. what? Yeah. You know, it, it's, it's, it's a snowball. Did you want to say, add anything? Yeah, I do. Thanks, I'd like to pipe in if I could. Um, sure. Um, which I appreciate everything that Felicia's saying. I, I think she's pretty much spot on. Um, I would, uh, I, I, I need the attorney here <laughs> to probably get to some of your questions, Joe. But um, there is a such thing as home rule. And that's mm -hmm. how the uh, decriminal, decriminalization initiatives work. You take a certain jurisdiction and uh let you know small town you know let's say it's in ken ohio since in ken ohio uh you go into ken ohio put a decrim on the ballot passes and then and i'll the police will tell you differently but according to the city charter uh if you're caught with 200 grams of marijuana there'd be no no fine no time and so those are how the local decrims work and i they work on the principle as i'm sure you guys are well more educated than i of home rule and I think that's what City of Columbus has done too, because City of Columbus, um, as you may know, uh, passed an, an initiative, I think through City Council, it wasn't really an initiative, passed an ordinance to City Council, where the maximum penalty for possessing, I think 200 grams of marijuana is $10. So I don't see why these kinds of things can't be replicated across cities, across, across the state. You know, Cleveland has one, Cincinnati has one, um I'm trying to think the most of the other ones are kind of small cities but nonetheless the major cities in ohio do ha have passed these measures and um have the plant penalties are very very light in those particular cities um so that that's your answer does that help you with your question joe i can't hear you this individual said that he could not get a job with the city of columbus because he's prescribed to use medical marijuana and so oh, okay. He, okay. That he, question. And right. I said, and I told him, I said, you know, I said, if it were me, I would, I would agree to that only for like employees that have to operate equipment, heavy equipment, you know, garbage trucks, things of that nature. But if you're a clerical worker working at a desk, I wouldn't have an issue with it. But he said, it, flat out, if you use medical marijuana, you cannot work for the city of Columbus. And I would want to know what would be a good argument that I could possibly use if I become mayor to say, look. If, as long as he gets a doctor's, you know, from a family doctor, not from uh, from a, his family doctor saying, yes, uh, he needs to have this. And uh, and I would be fine with that. But he said, it doesn't matter. Uh, I talked to an HR person from the county and they said, nope, doesn't matter who you get it from. We're not going to allow you. At least these, these companies and cities and things like that have anti-drug policies. Again, these sit policies that were put in place by the by the zealots back in the late 90s. Right. And we're still living with them today. Now, um, what I would say is, um, of course, have somebody go in and talk to your HR department, things like that, and see if you can have someone uh, redo those policies, make them more attuned with the times. Uh, there are 150,000 legal marijuana patients in the state of Ohio, so we're and we're not going away. And it, it's, only, the problem, it's only going to grow. So I think that some of these anti drug policies need to be revised. Nonetheless, yeah. With you, you're mayor, and you have the ability to go in and change those ordinances. Absolutely do it. You know, absolutely do it. I mean, marijuana, it's ridiculous that anybody, anybody goes to jail for marijuana. I can, I can actually present legislation, but the council would have to pass it. Right. And I think council's going to, they're Democrats, they're going to pass but it. Put, yeah, it puts them in, a, at least it yeah. puts them on a spot. But, but see, the bottom line, I mean, if you want to just put it in a box, just tell your friend to go out and spend a hundred bucks, spend a hundred bucks and buy, get a um, medical marijuana card, right? I'm a registered patient in the state of Ohio. I have the right uh, to me. I could, I could carry with me a 90 day supply. That's generally construed to be about nine ounces. So, you know, I think that that that's what has to, I, and I think that, that the program, because it's a medical program and, and, you know, it was, this is, that's kind of one of the reasons it gives a little bit of credit. And we, we, some people have problems with the fact that it's run through the board of pharmacy, but because it's run through the board of pharmacy during the pandemic, cannabis was an essential service. 
it was essential. We stayed up, all our dispensaries stayed open. And so that's the frame here. So if, if I'm a legal patient, I don't think there should be any discrimination. Certainly you're not gonna discriminate against taking a prescription drug. This is kind of in the same equivalent. Yeah, Mark, Joe. Joe, being a city employee, that, that it is drug free, and and uh, that whole that whole thing comes at us strong in collective bargaining, and we really, I uh, we use that as a chip to gain other things in a way. The city wants it. It's like we okay, okay, whatever, as long as it's not arbitrary and and capricious. Um, it is arbitrary and capricious. Drug well, it, drug it, it is, but it's not. The system, yeah, the system, well, to get in the system, yes. But once you're in the system, once you're protected by the union, it, it's not as arbitrary nor capricious. But, yeah, the, the, the door is definitely closed at this point. I, and, yeah, Mary Jane, is a, that's a valid argument to think um, – if you have a legal card for medical, then you should, that should be an, an exemption to the rule. So yeah, that, that'll be something the city administration will have to talk about down the road um, because it is something they come hard at in all collective bargaining. Felicia wanted to say something. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was just, I was going to say like, you know, um, uh, tagging on to what Mary Jane was talking about and, and for you, Joe. Um, it would make sense that if to review the kind of um, framework that you have a city employee or a state employee or a federal employee, right, whatever we're talking about, city or state, um, in regards to marijuana, if it's reframed in the, in, the, in the HR paperwork in the same way as someone taking medication for ADHD or they've got chronic pain or chronic fatigue and they're, they're taking, I mean, if you think about the kind of drugs that people take to manage other things outside of marijuana, these are controlled substances. They're oftentimes narcotics. They function in many ways the same way and more often than not because they're chemically derived or far more harmful to the body than something like marijuana. So if you have medical marijuana, why not instead of say, well, you're on medical marijuana, and that's this, and then this is all the other medicine that everyone else takes to live, and just put that in the same camp. So if you view medical marijuana the same way you view Ritalin, or if someone is bipolar, or and then they're taking lithium or something, or whatever the hell anyone is taking in order to function and have a good quality of life, why not just consider marijuana in the same camp? And then like, okay, you know, you're, we're not going to have you operate a crane if you are, you know, currently dosed. But if, you know, I mean, with all the different strains that they have, if you're taking something that it gives you better focus, but you've got to chill because you're dealing with, let's say, um, you've got bad anxiety exactly. or something like that, right? It all it's doing is helping your performance. So it's about reframing the argument. Again, think outside the box. Instead of saying, you, you know, just, just accept marijuana, reclassify it as something that is on the same level as these other prescribed controlled substances that doctors can prescribe to help with certain things. If you've got a patient that is fighting glaucoma, but wants to keep a job and the way that they're able to keep functioning is by taking marijuana on their lunch break before they start working after freaking let them, it's only helping them be productive, right? It I shouldn't be. The I wish that were the reality. I mean, I do. I mean, I, we've well, and that's what we should work for. Yeah. No, I, yeah. I, I've testified. I've testified before the High House, the Senate, and the task force about this stuff. I mean, length, lengthily, and uh, I've been at it for forty years now. Um, and, and I, I, I agree. Certainly, I agree with that in principle. I, I've had that argument how many dozen, how many hundreds of times I've had that argument. But in the practical sense, where Joe is at, the practical spaces where he's at, you have to go in and change the uh, what they call the, the drug, what they call the drug-free policy. There's a term for that. Get the top of my head, but there's a policy that these companies adopt and they they it, it, it's like automatic triggers and you have to go in and actually change the policy at the company yeah, and of when that happens you get you may or may, i think a lot of times the the the, 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 the slow moving 
but it is moving forward. There's a lot of uh, you know, prosecutors aren't prosecuting marijuana anymore. There's a lot of uh, companies that do recognize its, its medicinal mm-hmm. benefits. It probably yeah, wouldn't right. have a problem with a registered patient, but I uh, think when you, when you, I want you to be mayor. And yeah. I want you to go to city council, allow me to testify. Yeah. Please let me testify. Yeah. I will put together, just like I did for the abortion thing, I'll put together all these resources. Yeah. So when, so, when, so, that's the, so, just as I did with you know, um, you know, HB 523 in 2016. Those are great arguments. From what both of you said, I mean, that's what I wanted to hear. I mean, that's the kind of stuff I need to hear. But the, yeah, those are both. Great. So, so an administration, a future administration, can provide. And it's it is city council still, but they can provide leadership in letting ballot initiatives move forward. They can allow um uh, uh testimony to move forward they can have te- uh, testimony televised and 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 they can adjust that whole uh uh melu that we're in right now is very constricted you know you you don't have your voice recorded a lot of times joe because you're on a non-agenda item sorry you're not going to be listened to uh so <laughs> other 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 things that that we, an administration can adjust and make things more democratic in a sense, but, you know, ballot initiatives still cost money, still are thing. So Wendy is a guest. Uh, she's not speaking much, but she's been putting things into the she's she's I believe in Florida. Right. So thank you for joining us. Um, and uh, your 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 suggestion about ballot initiatives, I think, is very important on on so many different fronts about, you know, if the, the city council or the city attorney is saying he's not going to pro- prosecute, then why don't we get to the, the county prosecutor and TIAC and all them and say, you're not prosecuting anybody that does any health care issues uh, and, and, and expand that on out from where we can go. So, uh, uh, Mary Jane, Felicia, now Wendy, I, I, I'm including you in the conversation as well, um, since you, you're joining us from Florida, and I've I've enjoyed your your input uh, on Mondays with uh, Harvey. So, uh, so Mary Jane, or, uh, did you finish your thoughts? I, I didn't want to cut you off too much. I just wanted to make sure we got that point out there. And then also, you know, cutting, getting getting marijuana is actually pretty easy, right? <laughs> Uh, getting getting a, an abortion might not be down the road, uh, but Biden biding his time is is uh, really um, he put out that executive order saying he's going to protect the right to get uh, medical uh, access. Again, that's a divide between medical and health care. Um, right. And and the far, big pharma loves having medical access. They don't give a freak about health care. They don't care about you being healthy or wealthy and wise. They want you to get that dose, that dose, that dose. And and yeah. so that's a challenge. So Mary Jane, where are you at with that one, huh? Well, the abortion hmm. drug, I, I think that it should be, um, you know, available, you know, yeah, widely available. Um, now, it's going to be a prescription medication. So I think that you're probably going to have to somehow have a doctor in the loop on that. Mm-hmm. So uh, we're going to have to find doctors. Did you? I wanted to. Did you see that that, that situation thing with the Cleveland? I think it was a woman put out a call. She says this is a female doctor. She says I'm really upset about this and I want to get my other doctors involved. So she wrote a letter somehow like that, and she was looking for signers to it. She got 11. 1100 signers co-signers to this letter um basically i think it was aimed at the state of ohio all medical doctors sign 1100 medical doctors sign it can i mean oh my god can you imagine that can you, i'm like wow i mean that's that's a lot and um i think of that in that construct it's going to be have to figure out where is the doctor practicing medicine and and here's a big issue too and that is the the data there's so much medical data out there you know with with the doctors you know, and and there's of course hipaa there's all this collection of data so data has to be double protected under this new construct and so but if these doctors are willing to 
maybe function in these uh, sanctuary cities or these home rule cities, home rule locations, then they could begin to prescribe the um, abortion drugs for patients. But like I said, I think that since it's prescription, it will probably, and FDA controlled, it'll probably have to go through that gatekeeper. Mm-hmm. Um, now, I, I think that's where you get to some telemedicine, because some of these are going to be prescribed via telemedicine. Some of the states want to outlaw telemedicine because of that. So, um, and I think that and also, if you can have a fortune enough to live there near a state, you probably go to across, uh, hopefully if you cross state lines, go to a state and then get that, that prescription from that doctor. But these drugs are very effective. And so um, I think that, uh, that it is a good workaround because a lot of us, I mean, I, I'm way too old. I, I, I'm a mom. You know, I, I never had an abortion, you know, I, my son's 36 years old. So I'm in this because I, I'm passionate about you know, social justice. That's really why I'm in the fight, mm-hmm. you know, but, you know, I'm, a, I'm still, I'm a mom and, every, and all that goes with it. And I think that um, it, it, in that construct, if women can get access to those doctors, they can get those drugs. They're very, very safe. And I think that's the good end workaround. Thanks, Mary Jane. Wendy, did you unmuted? I, I didn't want to, I wanted to oh. get you involved in it if you wanted to and anybody else. Uh, Felicia, your closing statements would be coming up too as well. Uh, we're, okay. We usually try to get out of here um, not much after nine. Uh, we, we say seven to eight, but you know, we never end at eight and we never go and we never end at nine either. So, but <laughs> we uh, when we when we were live, when the salon was live, and we wanted to be live this this month, but you know, with the rise of COVID and a lot of people got sick at the Confest Community Festival yeah. last weekend, so we decided to say no to being online that or on site. So that's why we stayed online this month. Hopefully next next month we'll be able to be on on site, but. Um, we, we still want to do some kind of uh, uh, hybrid uh, at this point. So, uh, Wendy or any-